So, 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 Dr. Paul, let's let's turn to some exciting, novel thinking about about kidney cancer. So, the way I think about this is, is that for almost the last decade, uh, we have spent an enormous amount of time, energy, and resources uh, studying targeted therapy around the two major axes that you've talked about: anti-angiogenic, primarily through the VEGF pathway, proliferation, and glucose metabolism, primarily through mammalian target of rapamycin. We now have in, in 2015 going forward um, a revisiting of an old concept, and that is that um, immune-based therapies have the potential for long-term durable unmaintained remissions. And certainly our patients would benefit from long and durable unmaintained remissions. So tell me about the biology of checkpoint inhibitors in kidney cancer. Uh, tell me why uh, and where we should be studying it, and, and give us a sense of some of the early results that have been presented in the literature. Sure, sure. So taking a bird's eye view at this approach, you know, oftentimes to a patient describe this as being the fusion of immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Essentially, we're targeting certain immune-based elements. Um, so with the strategy of PD-1 and PD-L1 blockade, essentially we're augmenting the anti-tumor immune response. This is true irrespective of the agents that we're talking about here, nivolumab, MPDL, 328OA, et cetera. Um, and many of these drugs are showing substantial promise in early clinical trials and now are in late stages of development. And in the late stages of development, we know that, for example, nivolumab is being tested as monotherapy compared with everolimus in the second line setting. Uh, we know that ipilimumab and nivolumab are being compared to sunitinib in the frontline setting as examples of, of pivotal trials. Um, tell me how you talk to patients. So a patient comes in to see you. You have a combination targeted agent or a single agent targeted agent. Uh, the comparison is to existing therapy from over the last decade. They've heard all the hype about these new checkpoint inhibitors, but they still have to be randomized to a population where there's no crossover and they may not be available to them. How, how do you share that with, with patients and how should your community doctors share that with patients to know that not only is that the right thing to do, but we need the answers in order to get to the next phase of kidney cancer development? Absolutely, and I think you bring up a great point, which is that these approaches are completely investigational at this point. We really need that data, for instance, in the sunitinib versus nivolumab, ipilimumab study to really guide first-line therapy. Uh, I think we can learn a lot from the data sets that have been presented and published so far. Uh, for instance, we were involved with the phase one trial looking at that combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab. The toxicities here really aren't negligible. We really do run into some significant issues potentially with, uh, with GI toxicities and hepatic toxicities, uh, and it really requires immediate and very prudent management. Um, so in addition to counseling patients against the, the hype that's associated with these drugs, I think that it's important to suggest that there are potential uh, sequela from these therapies, toxic side effects, and so forth. Um, my experience in the second line setting um, suggests that perhaps nivolumab as monotherapy may be better tolerated than that frontline combo that's being explored with nivolumab and ipilimumab. It's going to be interesting to see how that data set pans out because certainly I think that the tolerability of nivolumab monotherapy is great. So Dr. George, I mean clearly it, when we talk about immune-based therapies, we would love to have a predictor of who's going to benefit. The SELECT trial just read out in clinical cancer research from Dave McDermott that despite all of our efforts over a long period of time with high-dose interleukin-2, carbonic anhydrase-9, we really don't know how to pick the winner, so to speak, which means you have to treat everybody to find the, the, the few that are going to benefit. Any hints in the immune therapy setting with checkpoint inhibitors, tumors that express PD-1 or PDL one uh, immune systems or the tumor microenvironment, anything that we can use going forward, or is that still pretty much experimental? Uh, I think this is, uh, you, you bring a very important point. So biomarker development, it, it should be concurrent with the drug development. And, and again, now we have a, a drug with a target, which, which is potentially going to uh, pan out as a biomarker or predictive biomarker, uh, and we don't have data from large studies. So definitely we need th those studies for validation. There may be some signals from small studies, 
but uh, at this point we don't have a good signal to use PDL1 expression or anything like that. And that being said, um, the expression of PDL1 is not in every tumor. So that, that's probably going to be very crucial um, in terms of selecting, um, selecting patients um, uh, for such therapies. And, uh, and, and the large studies which were designed in the past uh, couple of years or co completed in the past couple of years, um, including the one comparing uh, nivolumab to um, Everolimus, um, they, they have incorporated some biomarker development uh, approaches. So, so this is totally different from the biomarker approaches done in the select, to select study that you mentioned, where you know IL-2 use, we don't really know where it's hitting and what is changing. Is it the immune, is it the immune status of the host which we should measure, or is it something in the tumor that we should measure? So, so it's really hard to find a predictive marker unless you have a very specific target like in this case, I think it might play out to be very significant. Yeah, and I think that for our community, they, they need to acknowledge that, that we're going to hunt for those biomarkers, that that's part of what's embedded in the, in the trial designs. Um, but oftentimes, the best marker of benefit is our patients, and they tell us whether they're gonna benefit or not, and uh, we may not yet have the right way to select who will and who won't benefit. Um, do you have any fears, Dr. Paul, about sequential TKI versus immunotherapy, immunotherapy versus TKI? I mean, do you think that, and you, you were involved in some of the trials that combined the immunotherapy and the TKIs. Can you comment about uh, kind of where you think we are in that space? Sure, sure. So I think that, you know, intuitively we would think of combining VEGF directed therapy and immunotherapy as a potential home run, taking two very active categories of agents and simply lumping them together. You know, unfortunately, the challenge that we have in the phase one assessment of sunitinib with nivolumab as well as pizopinib with nivolumab um, is substantial hepatic and gastrointestinal toxicity that ultimately proved to be prohibitive to further development of those regimens. And so as a consequence, what we see moving forward is a uh, regimen assessed in that same phase one trial, nivolumab and ipilimumab. In terms of sequencing these agents, it's hard to make any predictions. One study uh, that uh, we just published in the Journal of Urology looked at pizopinib as a third-line therapy. Now, in and of itself, I don't think the study really produced any uh, major clinical findings, but we had the opportunity to do some really extensive correlatives. And what we found is that as resistance to pizopinib therapy evolved, you actually see a rise in immune-based markers, IL-6, IL-8. You see an infiltration of MDSCs and a greater preponderance of those subsets of cells. Um, and this might potentially predispose to a response to immunotherapy. This is all conjecture, but I think it might su potentially support that sequence of VEGF-TKI to nivolumab, for instance. Is it possible that the sickest patients are the ones most likely to benefit from immune therapy? Gosh, I mean, I, I certainly think it's within the realm of possibility because certainly you'd expect a preponderance of those immune markers in those patients. Absolutely. Um, before we go